Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 789 for the 19th of November 2023. Richard Saunders coming to you from Oregon. I'm walking by the beautiful Deschutes River. A wonderful experience. It's crispy cold and there's no animals to be seen. No bears, no squirrels, no ducks, no geese. It's okay, but beautiful waterfalls along the way. Coming up on this week's episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast, Adrian Hill is joined once again by Kat McLeod in Canada as they give you an update on recent health stories they've been bringing you and concerns from that part of the world. Following that, it's Brian Dunning, Fraser Kane, and myself sort of chewing the fat a little bit about skeptical issues. And this is part one of a five-part series where the three of us, three podcasters, talk about the world of skepticism. Also on today's show, Adrian Hill returns with the Australian Skeptics newsletter, I speak to George Harab from the Geologic Podcast, who was at the recent meeting in Las Vegas. And the Trove segment looks at mind reading. Well, that's enough for me. It's time for me to keep walking along this trail, looking at the beautiful river cascading below me. I'm not even going to look for some food because there's none here. And while I do that, I hope you enjoy the Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello, everyone. This is Adrian Hill from Skookum Studios, and today I have Kat coming back. We're going to update the last two segments that we did together, plus report on some of the feedback we got for the herbal supplement bit that we did a few weeks ago. Welcome back, Kat. Thanks for having me back, Adrian. It's always great to be here with you. So first, we're going to do a little update on hostage tape, which we talked about in episode number 778. And this morning when I woke up on November 9th, the Globe and Mail, which is one of Canada's national newspapers, wrote an article called, quote, Will Mouth Taping Actually Help Me Stop Snoring? and sleep better, end quote. And they discuss hostage tape, which we discussed in quite some detail, didn't we? We did. They're just riding our coattails. According to this article, Alex Neist, who is the founder of the hostage tape company, says that the idea behind the name is that poor sleep is holding people hostage. Well, and the article did say much the same as what we said in the episode, in that it might help a little bit, but it may not. And more importantly, talk to your doctor before ever trying something like this. Yeah, because there's a lot of other things that you can try that are probably going to be more effective, safer, and cheaper. Exactly. Moving on to the herbal remedies segment that we did on episode 785, we got some pretty interesting feedback, didn't we? We did, and I love feedback. Except when it's on a bad mic. I love it. A fellow Edmontonian reached out to me on TikTok, and he talked to me about his mom, who had been in the hospital, I believe this was about a year and a half ago, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. Eventually, her kidney shut down, and she did pass away, sadly. And now he's wondering if it was all of the supplements and herbal remedies that she was taking that may have caused her demise. Yeah, which is sad. So sad. He's really worried because his father also takes a lot of those same supplements and herbs. So it just reminds us that this story is still important to tell. Yeah, exactly. Things are happening today, even though your story goes back, you know, a number of years, we still have to worry about the herbal supplements. 
And I had a Canadian public health inspector reach out to me. And if you're listening, hello, fellow Canadian skeptic. His name is Alex Murdoch, and he lives on the east coast of Canada. He approves food applications for vendors and markets. And lately, he told me in his email that farmers markets have been applying to sell Kratom products. And he was not aware that they were illegal in Canada. Kat and I found lots of information on Health Canada's website, though it wasn't that easy to find, was it? No, you really have to have your investigative tools all all in the same toolbox to find this information out. And I was happy to share all of my resources with this gentleman. Yeah. And he was saying how difficult it is to keep up with all of the Health Canada regulations, which I think is a huge issue. So these people are really trying hard to combat this misinformation, but it's certainly not that easy to do. And this shows how important it is. He wants to make sure that any products being sold are going to be safe and are legal. And he didn't realize that Kratom actually isn't legal to sell in Canada. Exactly. And we wanted to make sure we were really clear. We talked about it being illegal. And we did find some more information and a nice, concise evaluation on psychedeliclaw.ca, which I love the name. I of their love that name. Website. And it states, quote, Kratom is legal for personal use and possession, but sale, distribution and other activities involving the substance are illegal under Canadian federal law. Kratom is not criminally prohibited in Canada. It has, however, been identified by Health Canada as an unauthorized health product, end quote. It's unapproved for sale for human or animal consumption and is prohibited under the Food and Drugs Act. Likely why it's not illegal to have possession of it is for research purposes. Right. Because I was wondering that, because it seems strange that you can't sell it, you can't advertise it, you can't import it, but you can have it. Exactly. Is it something that you can grow yourself? Do you know? I do believe you can grow Kratom yourself. To give an example of what happens in Canada when someone is found selling Kratom, we found on the Government of Canada Recalls and Safety Alert website that in 2018, there were multiple seizures of Kratom in Edmonton and Toronto. A warning was issued to Canadians not to use these products, stating, Kratom products are not authorized by Health Canada and may pose serious health risks. It's illegal to sell any health products in Canada without authorization from Health Canada. And next, Kat, you actually had a little talk with somebody at, the, at your bank, I believe. I did. Shortly after the podcast aired, I had an appointment with a banking advisor and I went into the bank and of course I'm masked because I haven't stopped masking. And we got onto the topic of, you know, why, you know, I'm compromised. And I just happened to mention, oh yeah, it's because I took herbs. This appointment ended up having two advisors come into the room and we talked so much about the dangers of herbal remedies that to go back in two weeks time to actually do the banking that I was supposed to get done. <laughs> So if you give me the platform, I will tell everybody the dangers of herbal remedies. <laughs> and lastly, Daniel Reed, friend of the podcast. Hello, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. He reached out to us for more information to help his coworker. So I quickly put him in touch with Kat, because of course, she's my resource. His coworker is taking some herbal supplements. And because he's in America, it's a lot harder for him to find resources. So I let him know that I always search for the main ingredient in a supplement with the words risk or side effects or dangers. I reference the Health Canada website because I'm Canadian, um, but anyone in the world can look at the Health Canada site. I also look for peer-reviewed studies there is an article I think that you found, Adrian, in Science-Based Medicine on Kratom. That's correct, yes. And in March of 2023, the FDA launched a website directory of dietary supplement ingredients, which is a good resource for investigating what may be in a supplement. Yeah, that's a good, good thing to know. We'll put the link to that in the show notes. And Adrian, it isn't just herbal products that are dangerous because health food products are considered a natural health product in Canada as well. And why would that matter to most people? 
Well, as we were doing research, we found out that in June of 2022, there was an outbreak of illness linked to lentil leak crumbles, which led to a daily harvest recall of products that were eventually implicated in 133 hospitalizations and 329 illnesses, according to an investigation done by the FDA. And this this was not just in the U.S. If I remember correctly, it was also in like Australia and Canada and Europe. It was around the world where these products were sold. Absolutely. They are sold internationally. I could only find stats on the FDA investigation, though. Of course. Yeah. I know that one gentleman ate the lentil crumbles twice and he had to have his gallbladder removed. Yeah, that's serious. He was hospitalized because he got so sick and they removed his gallbladder. And do they know why there were these hospitalizations with this product? They believe that the cause is terra flower. Terra is a genus of flowering plants in the legume family. It's grown for several purposes, including as a food additive, which is commonly terra gum, which is very safe. Terra flower comes from the seeds of the terra trees. It's relatively new and very high in protein, but it has not been researched or proven to be safe. It should be noted that it is possible that the flower that was used in the daily harvest recall could have been made from a related species of plant, and it was made in error because they didn't test the main ingredient that they were working with. So they may have thought it was terra seed, and it may have been a different plant, but they're really not sure exactly of what is accounting for these illnesses. It's interesting that they still don't know, but they can bring it back to that particular product. Are there other products that use terra flower? Terra flower is fairly new on the market, but because of its high protein, more and more vegan and vegetarian foods are starting to look into using this, but we don't know that it's safe yet. Yeah. And it may very well not be safe. Right. So further investigation needs to be attempted before it's going to be finding its way into more products. Is Terra Flower available in products in the U.S. and Canada? I haven't found anything about Terra Flower being approved in Canada. In America, they have a grandfathering process so that if a product has been proven safe historically, a similar product can automatically be used. Right. So in this case, since Terra gum, which is used as a thickening agent in so many products and is not an issue, it's totally safe. Because it's from the same plant, Terra flower was grandfathered in without any efficacy or research being done on it. And we think that's where the problem lies. Well, that's good to know. And hopefully they will investigate it more now that they've had this issue. Yeah. And the recall happened worldwide. Hopefully there aren't other products out there, but I did a search and you can find Terra Flower on Amazon to use in your own baking. Don't just assume that because it's in the market that it's safe to use. Exactly. And that leads me into an interesting experience I had recently where I went to the Wild Bird Store in Calgary. It's a wonderful store and it was their annual sale. And they had tea and coffee and goodies in the back room, which I'd never actually been in before. And there on a shelf prominently displayed was Neolife. Have you ever heard of that, Cat? I have not heard of Neolife. And I had not either, but it was quickly apparent it was some kind of supplement. And there was another lady standing there and I kind of made a gasping sound like, oh my. And she says, oh, do you use this? And I said, no, and I probably wouldn't. And she goes, why? So I said, well, if you look at this brochure, look at what it says it does. And anytime it says all of these things, I would be very doubtful about taking this product. So this is what it says. It says, experience the benefits of powerful nutrients that support abundant energy, powerful antioxidant protection, lifelong heart health, optimum immune strength. And we talked a little bit about that (laughs) one. And she was right on board. She was really fun to talk to. Healthy brain function, flexible, healthy joints, clear vision, youthful skin, hair and nails, lifelong cellular health. And my favorite, because I think this suits me quite well, natural genetic anti-aging function, (laughs) whatever that means. (laughs) They've confused me already, but apparently their website was also a little confusing or misleading. 
According to the website, quote, the neolife difference, based in nature, backed by science. Well, there we go. We have to have science in there, right? And the nature. Got to have them yes. both together. And what's really gratifying is this woman actually decided definitely she would not be buying the products after our little discussion. It was a fun discussion we had. Yeah. And Neolife has been around since 1958. It's available worldwide, including in Australia, New Zealand, and obviously Canada, if you go to the right bird store. <laughs> <laughs> you can go online too. But yes, if you go to your local bird store, apparently you can get this stuff. <laughs> Pick up your wild bird seed and don't forget your Neolife. Well, with that thought, I think it's a good time to wrap up. It's been so fun having you on here again, Kat. Lots of laughs as usual. And I hope to see you soon. Remind us how we can find you. Sure. You can find me on TikTok or Instagram at Kitty Corner Skeptic. Awesome. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill and Kat McLeod from Skookum Studios and 300 kilometers northeast, someplace in Edmonton. Hello, Skeptic Zone listeners. This is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Wikipedia Project. I also explore the world of psychic mediums, grief vampires, and expose their tricks and methods to exploit people. If you'd like to join me on this journey, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube, Psychics Explained. Or if you need help remembering that name, it's also Psychic Sex Plained. I think I'll get a lot more viewers that way, but please join the conversation and subscribe. Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today, and I have gathered together two of my favorite members of the skeptic community, uh, Brian Dunning, <laughs> Richard Saunders. They're right here. Hi. And, and I have been thinking a lot about the role skepticism plays, scientific knowledge, scientific literacy. How can we navigate and help other people navigate this world today? And so I wanted to just ask them a bunch of questions, freeform thoughts about this. When did you guys become, Brian, when did you become a skeptic? Uh, well, I, you know, without knowing that there was such a thing, certainly without name, I mean, I guess I'd always been one as far as I can remember. Um, I, I will couch that in being a science communicator and knowing a lot of people in science communication. We all grew up obsessed with science fiction. Many of us had all the books on ghosts and hauntings and the Amityville horror and Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and the Bermuda Triangle and all of these weird things. And I believed every every word of it. So um, although I say now that I even would say, consider myself a skeptic back then, I just didn't have any tools mm. or any knowledge with which to filter these things. But I, my curiosity about what was really happening with them I would say is what really distinguishes a skeptic. It's not to simply stop at the popular explanation. It's a ghost, it's paranormal, there's the supernatural is a real thing, period. I, I believe that they all have some natural explanation, I just didn't know what it was. So I would say that I've pretty much always had a skeptical attitude and had the curiosity to go all the way and find out what's really happening. Richard? Well, when I, Brian and I are very similar age and which he's, is, old, he's older. I'm a bit older than him. We grew up in the same era. And, uh, you know, people of our vintage will well remember the fad, the craze of the paranormal from in the 1970s, largely spurred on by Yuri Geller and that sort of stuff. And when I was an impressionable young kid, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, aliens, it was almost like any day now. This would be revealed, because, <laughs> and that's my and and as a kid, 
absorbing all this media and this sensational, interesting stuff, and I was just driven by curiosity. That's what got me into skepticism. It was not wanting to, to um, debunk at all. It was wanting to know. Yeah. Where are the aliens? What does the old Loch Ness monster, uh, Loch Ness monster look like? <laughs> you know, I couldn't believe that everyone else wasn't as horrified of Bigfoot as I was. <laughs> this thing's this running around true. the forest because and nobody seems to care. <laughs> that's what we were told. Yeah. By everyone, the media. It was yeah. and people who said no, it doesn't exist were were written off. No, they don't know what they're talking about. Of mm. course, Bigfoot's real, but I think why I'm a skeptic. Or why I have the attitude I have is largely driven by curiosity, wanting to know what's really going on, and this having the skeptical side, which I've I've uh, absorbed over the last three decades or whatever it has, means I hope that I have a better grasp on what's really going on. Mm. So it's it's a very good tool. For me, it was Demon Haunted World. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I always been into space and science and science fiction, all that kind of stuff. And so I was reading a, a bunch of books and I was making my way through Carl Sagan books and really enjoying them. Pale Blue Dot. Yeah. And and then I got my hands on Demon Haunted World and I actually had no idea what the book was about. It was just a Carl Sagan book and I was going to read it. And he went into explaining the dragon in your garage yes. uh -huh. mystery yeah. and how... You know, if a person is explaining to you that they have a dragon in their garage and you say, well, can I come take a look at it? And they go, well, you can't because it's invisible. And you're like, okay, well, there's got to be some other way we can do this. Maybe an infrared camera. No, because of invisible to infrared. And they just keep <laughs> yeah, yeah. sort of pushing the, the goalposts away. You start to go, wait a minute. This, this, this dragon might not exist. This happens again and again and again in the skeptical investigations. When I, you might have come across this yourself, but when I'm being investigating or testing people or whatever the case may be, this dragon in the in the garage repeats and repeats and repeats. Yeah. Oh, I can't be tested by skeptics. Oh, it normally works, but not today. Uh, and it's it's astonishing. Yeah. You know, he was so on the ball with that analogy. And and I think what I got from that was what he called the baloney detection, detection kit. Yeah. Detection <laughs> kit. <laughs> yeah. As a as a, just a framework to examine claims that are made to find out whether or not there's sufficient evidence that you should believe them too. And the other thing was uh, like but an enthusiasm for science, for, yeah. the, for what the outcome of a scientifically educated populace is, that it's such a good thing that if people do understand science, then everything does progress because of all of the ways of thinking of the different philosophies that we have, science delivers results. And not, not, you know, not that other philosophies don't as well, but, it, but, but our modern world is just the outcome of all of this science. And so what role do you think skepticism has in our modern era? Oh, it's a, it's a changing role. I mean, when the, when the modern skepticism began in the, roughly in the 70s, or you could argue in the 60s, because James Randi was doing things, you know, for, that's why he had his original uh, prize. His original prize, I think, dates back from 1964. There's like, what, a million dollars if someone well, could... Yeah, well, I think well, it's way it, back it, then, it was like a thousand. Yeah. Like Ten thousand or something. He, he was on a radio program and he was challenged to put his money where his mouth is. And he did. He wrote a check right on the spot. And I think that was either 64 or 65. But but there are various, you know, over the years it went up to a million dollars. But in Australia, it's a hundred thousand dollars. In California, I think it's... it's yeah, half Five hundred thousand, yeah. Whatever, whatever the case may be. But skepticism has changed in, in all those years where it was... Uh, you know, and my heart still lies in in, in the exploration of, of amazing claims. That's what I love to do. I love to investigate amazing claims because it's it's just what I think is fascinating beyond belief, driven by curiosity. But it's it's hard because it's a little hard for the modern skeptical movement because there are so many other fringe issues now encroaching. And people want us to do that. We hear it again and again and again. You skeptics should do this. Or you skeptics should do that. You're not a skeptic because you're not interested in my pet uh, problem at the moment with society. And I try to, st with the Australian skeptics, I try to steer a very narrow course. We stick to the core. Like what's the core? Ghosts? 
Well, <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's well, it's 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 tough, you know. It, it, yes, it's ghosts. It's the paranormal claims. It's it's, but it it extends into things like we do a lot of uh, what you could call consumer investigations, stopping people getting ripped off mm -hmm. by false products, false cures, false remedies. And where it gets very serious is our fights against the conspiracy theorists when it comes to anti vaccination mm. stuff, and that's very important. And, and that's straying a little bit from the core, and that's fine. I'm very comfortable with that. But when it gets, the, the sphere gets out to, they want people, want us to tackle social issues. And we start to say, well, that's not really. You but know. isn't that what Carl Sagan warned us about? Like, he, you know, he said, what's the problem with people liking, you know, to, to, to find, do astrology? Right. And isn't it just fun to find out what your sun sign is and find out whether or not you should, you know, you learn a little bit about your behavior. And he is. said, he said, yes, but you can imagine people taking this kind of thinking to the to another degree. And and I think, say, anti vaccination, you know, anti vax movements, things like that, where actual harm is being done, people yep. are giving people homeopathic medicine yes. thinking it's going to cure them from cancer yes. you know harm is being done is and being the, done. these are the things that sagan saw immediately it was the, yeah. the inevitable harm I think it's a very of this process yeah, yeah yeah and so do you think how do you think about like brian how do you think about the harm that's being done by the, the, where skepticism can provide the at least some kind of yeah searchlight on it right? so a, a friend of mine uh, once defined skepticism as the intersection between science education and consumer protection. <laughs> the more you understand about the way the world really works, what's real and what's not, the less likely you are to be ripped off or led astray or led to believe that some magical thing is going to cure your cancer yeah. or that you're going to make a lot of money through some multi-level marketing scheme. Or I mean, There's a million ways that consumers are ripped off every day. Uh, because people are selling things that are, can I say bullshit? I don't know who's using this recording. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it, it, it extends at the worst to life and death decisions about medical care or yes. vaccines. Yes. Just, I mean, no more dramatic, um, no more dramatic d demonstration ever than the COVID um, pandemic that we just went through. Um, so when you talk about what's the harm in grandma believing her poodle is psychic, no harm in that. And if you think that that's, if you understand that that's not real, you can have fun with it and you can enjoy the belief just like you can enjoy looking up your star sign and everything. But it, if you think it's real, then it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than just a gateway drug into other beliefs. It's establishing a thought pattern that, that is the, way, the one that you follow. And if you follow it, a faulty thought pattern to make life decisions, who knows how you can be taken advantage of? Because there are people who are very deliberately looking for people oh, yes. who believe in this or who mm. believe in that or who believe in this, and they will take your money. Next week in part two of this series, Fraser, Brian, and Richard discuss true believers versus scam artists, sham health tests, confronting people about their beliefs, and how to change people's minds. Les habla Paula desde la hermosa ciudad de Buenos Aires en Argentina. Cuando escuchamos podcasts, escuchamos los mismos que escucha todo el mundo, como The Skeptic Zone. Ojalá puedan venir a visitarnos algún día. Los esperamos con nuestras riquísimas comidas locales y hasta podemos ir a bailar un tango. Mientras tanto, sigan disfrutando de su dosis semanal de ciencia y pensamiento racional. Chao. Hello, everyone.
everyone. This is Adrienne Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Canada, and I'm here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. And according to Richard, I will never get through this without giggles. So be ready. This is newsletter number 186. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's see what Tim Mendham has for us this week. Hi all, says Tim. Just a few weeks to Skepticon. But you've still got time to book your place, in person, online, or single-day tickets. Check out the program to see what tickles your fancy. Meanwhile, once you've booked your ticket, there's a panoply of stuff to pass the time between now and then. Read on, Tim. Okay, Tim, I'll do just that. Update, Skepticon 2023, which is December 2nd through 3rd. Speakers Program. The program for speakers at the 2023 Australian Skeptics Annual National Convention, Skepticon, is available, giving you the day and time for each presentation. The speaker lineup is an impressive offering, both the speakers themselves and the topics. You should be there, whether in person to meet fellow skeptics and get something signed, or at least online when you can watch it all in your pajamas, with or without the signatures. Speakers include Nathan Eggins, musician, conspiracy of one, dinner entertainer, and joint MC. Susan Gerbeck, skeptical activist, Wikipediatrician, psychic buster, perennial fun, and energizer bunny. Melanie Teresa King, critical thinker, education, and science communicator. Stephen Bavaro, researcher, humanist, skeptic, and student of pseudo-archaeology. Sue Irachi, emergency medicine specialist on what leads conventionally trained doctors to turn to pseudoscience. And too many more to mention here. Skepticon will be held on December 2nd through 3rd at the Ian Potter Auditorium in the Kenneth Meyer Building, University of Melbourne, Parkville. Tickets cover one and two day bookings, full price and concession, as well as the dinner itself. Tickets for online viewing are also available. Just visit www.skepticon.org.au. Anti-vaxxers in Western Australia local elections. Candidates backed by an anti-vaccine conspiracy theory promoting group have been elected to councils across Western Australia after last month's election following campaigns in which they played down or hid their fringe beliefs. They reportedly see this as a springboard to state and federal elections. Anti-vaxxers are pretending flawed study vindicated. The sudden appearance of a claim that a long discredited and retracted paper claiming that the COVID vaccines had killed nearly 300,000 Americans had been reinstated and the claims rapid spread across the anti-vaccine ecosystem speaks volumes about how, quote, bad papers written by anti-vax ideologues designed to promote a narrative that vaccines are dangerous and or ineffective, never die, end quote. Growing skepticism toward vaccines. Meanwhile, a University of Pennsylvania survey has found that Americans are less likely, by 6%, to consider it safe to get the measles, mumps, rubella, pneumonia, and COVID vaccines than they were two and a half years ago. The director of the study says that the rhetoric surrounding COVID vaccination increases acceptance of misinformation and decreases confidence in vaccines. And that's the bulk of this article. It will take you approximately one minute to read. Well, so far I'm not giggling a lot. A lot of this is making me very sad. The Haunting of Modern China 
This is a fascinating, if long, article that looks at attitudes in Nanjing, Hong Kong, and other Chinese cities where rapid urbanization is multiplying a fear of death and belief in ghosts. Not to mention a distaste for funeral workers. Almost a giggle. Royal family, UFOs, and the paranormal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The King of UFOs documentary investigating the royal family's interest in UFOs and unexplained phenomena. It features exclusive access to unreleased archives and interviews with witnesses, as well as examining claims that Prince Charles piloted an experimental UFO craft in, you guessed it, Canada <laughs> in 1975. Due for release on December 1st. No doubt to coincide with the first day of Skepticon. <laughs> I think you should all go and watch it and report back. <laughs> Legacy of the Duke Parapsychology Lab. This is a story from the American University where the pioneers of modern scientific parapsychological research, specifically J.B. Rhine, had their start. The article is pretty sympathetic to the cause. Calling all Aussie scientists. Next year's Pint of Science Festival is on May 13th through 15th, and the organizers are seeking expressions of interest from engaging scientists who are doing amazing work and are happy to talk about it, whether online or in person. If you are one or know someone who is, the deadline is December 22nd, 2023 at 11:59 p.m. to be precise. They're also looking for volunteers and city coordinators to help out. Google Pint of Science Australia for more information. We are currently working on the December issue of The Skeptic with a look at some famous or infamous UFO and haunting claims. Meanwhile, the September 2023 issue of The Skeptic looks at the risks The critics and the hoaxes associated with the golden age of parapsychology, the World Health Organization's promotion of alt med, and the rehabilitation of Yuri Geller. If you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. You can sign up for a hard copy or digital edition, or both, since the digital is offered free to those who take up the hard copy version. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. Learn more about our magazine and subscribe now at www.skeptics.com.au. Items of interest: Kentucky's dark tourism. The Kentucky After Dark initiative provides tourists with. Passports and encourages them to explore towns that have long been shrouded in eerie myths, spanning decades, such as a seven-foot-tall dogman with glowing red eyes, elusive Bigfoot creatures haunting a hotel, and beautiful witches burned alive on fire. <laughs> There's one for the kids. Listicle. U.S. cities most likely to have a haunted house. The U.S. insurance company Assurance IQ recently ranked U.S. cities on the probability of living in a haunted home, weighing in factors like homes with reports of deaths, homicides, and paranormal activity. Tulsa, Oklahoma, topped its ghoulish leaderboard with about 330 haunted houses per 1,000 homes. <laughs> If Tulsa has more than 30 percent of its houses affected by quote deaths, homicides, and paranormal activity end quote, possibly linked to the 1927 race massacre, then it sounds like it might be a place to avoid. In the same top ten is Dayton, Ohio, which fans of Randy Newman will know is the sort of place where people say, 
hi to you from their front porch. But are they ghosts? Expecting the spectral. More than half of Americans surveyed by Pew say they've been visited by a ghost. Women are significantly more likely than men to say they have been visited. Catholics and members of historically black churches were quite a bit more likely to report visits from dead relatives. Some 66 and 67 percent, respectively, and only 12 percent of atheists reported feeling the presence of a dead family member. Bigfoot traces have been found in rural Wales. Wales is not known as Sasquatch country. More rugby players than tall heavyweight. Anyway, for some reason, stories of this recent find keep comparing the size 23 footprint with that of basketball player Shaquille O'Neal. Footprints and a lair were found by, quote, paranormal researchers and filmmakers working on a new TV series, end quote. Surely, this couldn't be a promo stunt. And then, no sooner published than a cryptozoologist has come forward and said he and a TV crew are the hoaxers. Surprise! But we can't help wondering if the hoax debunker is also a hoax. Welcome to the postmodern world of suspicion and conspiracies. Ooh, Kenny Biddle, you might want to listen up here. Most foul-mouthed haunted doll in the UK. A doll thought to be 100 years old has been spitting out foul-mouthed tirades after being donated to a museum for haunted objects, according to paranormal investigators. You can use your imagination, replacing certain words as you see fit. So the doll says... You're forked. Fork this. Or shut the fork up. She also recently blurted out, Twit! And, You forking idiot. Add that doll to the Christmas list for your least favorite niece. Or nephew. (laughs) Well, that's the newsletter. Now it's time for me to grab my toque and go outside for a run and just give her a... And that is spelled G-I-V-E apostrophe R and was suggested to me by Canadian East Coast listener Alex Murdoch. You can probably guess from the context that this means to try hard. What you might not know is that it is used to indicate trying hard in an impressive feat. And to me, running in below freezing temperatures on icy sidewalks is an impressive feat. Until next time... This is Adrian Hill. I'm Mick West. In my podcast, Tales from the Rabbit Hole, I've extended conversations with people who have been involved in conspiracy culture. I do this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's really interesting. These people have great stories about how they fell down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, what they did down there, and what it was that helped them out. Sometimes I also talk to people who investigate conspiracy theories, and they have equally fascinating stories from the other side. Secondly, I want to understand how best to prevent the spread of conspiracy theories and misinformation, which is an increasing problem in a time when alternative media is exploding. The best way to do this is to communicate effectively with the people involved, and the best way to do that is with a nice long chat. Check it out. Tales from the Rabbit Hole. TFTRH.com Here in Las Vegas, live. Good morning. Just <laughs> good. Look, listen to that Vegas voice. That when there's no water in yeah. the air for forty thousand square miles, this is what you sound like. Yeah, me days. too. Uh, uh, yeah. We should do a podcast. Oh my gosh, we should just do the, the <laughs> ASMR Vegas Voice Podcast. Yes, good. Yeah. As you fall asleep, make sure to remember: stay skeptical, question things. Well, that'd be great. I think that'd be good. And watch the, watch the skies. Watch the skies. 
And you are this year, you're uh, the MC for this wonderful conference. Morning. Yes. Well, indeed. indeed. And Once it's, again. unbelievably, it's the last day. It's, I, I was just saying that the time, I think as we get older, there's this strange thing that sometimes, sometimes hours feel endless and months go by in a, mm. in a blink. Years go by mm. in a blink. Here we are three days into this, four mm -hmm. days into this conference, and we're done. And it has just flown by, chock full of information. And I can't believe uh, here we are, walking the hallway to the, to the last sessions. And, of course, uh, the Geologic Podcast powers on. What episode are you up to now? Oh, I don't know. What is it? Some, 6,024. Some, yeah, some Fibonacci number. I don't <laughs> even keep track anymore. I'm not even sure if that number exists. We're in the 800s, whatever. But, yeah. It's mm. all, well, you're, you're up, up there as well. I'm, you're, yeah, I'm in the late 700s. Late yeah. 700s. Later. Yes, yes. The, the plague era. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where you're at, and I'm I'm just about to discover refractive lenses, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're giddy. Coffee's still coming in. Yeah, well, listen to this echoing. Look, yeah. look at the size of this hall we're in. It's, Hello. It's, it's like all of Vegas is either yeah. minuscule or gigantic, and there's nothing in between. How can listeners who haven't done it, and I'm sure there are none who haven't done it, none. but if in case there are, how can they... Catch up with the Geologic Podcast. Oh, you go over to geologicpodcast.com and you download the thingy and you put the things in your ears or maybe you put a speaker on to annoy your neighbors and then you just give a listen and then you go, Richard, really? That's yeah. where you sent me? Yeah, I'm really? sorry. I'm oh sorry. Oh, gosh. Come on. We're in the conference room itself. And Which I, have to, I have to say, the pre-show music has been some of the best at any conference Isn't ever. That cool? It's been a lot of Dave Brubeck, a lot of Monk, Ooh. a lot of sort of uh, 50s jazz. I've been so happy every morning to just come in here and bop along to this fan non kind of, you know, Enya sounding music. It's great. It's really really cool. Thanks to our wonderful sound crew. Break a leg. Thank you. This is Dr. Carl, Carl Krasinski, proud to be a skeptic, and you can find out more about me at drcarl.com and get lots of free stuff there as well. Pages at Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia. And I've come across a very interesting series from 1938. And this was syndicated, so I've discovered this in various newspapers at the time. But I will be reading from the Saturday Evening Express, dated the 9th of April, 1938, page 12. And this has to do with mental telepathy. The series is called Mind Reading as a Science, and this is part one. Mental Telepathy and How It Functions, by Joseph Dunninger, chairman of the Universal Council of Psychic Research and noted telepathist. This is the first of a series of 24 exclusive articles on mental telepathy, one of the most discussed subjects of the day, written for The Express by Joseph Dunninger. Next week, he'll deal with some theories regarding telepathy. Well, let's get to this week. I don't know if we'll get through 24 parts to this, but let's just start with part one and uh, see how we go. Nearly everyone can become a mind reader. This may be regarded as a conservative statement, insomuch as a prominent scientist was recently quoted as making a similar pronouncement without the modification of the word nearly. However, from my own observations while conducting experiments as a mind reader, 
I am not convinced that the ability is universal, although it appears to exist among the vast majority of persons. Mind reading depends on telepathy, which was formally termed, quote, thought transference, or mental telegraphy, end quote. While the physical causes of telepathy have not been determined, the faculty itself has been demonstrated, and therefore we have some knowledge of how it functions, even though we do not know exactly why it does so. What is telepathy? To define telepathy simply, let us say that it is a coincidental thought gained by two persons without the aid of recognized communication, and to a degree precludes the possibility of chance. One such occurrence, no matter how amazing it might seem, could not be regarded as beyond the possibility of chance. Therefore, the proof of telepathy depends upon the repetition of thought coincidences to a frequency beyond the law of averages. Experiments conducted at intervals during the last 40 years have shown that this actually occurs and recent tests on a more extensive scale than formerly served to prove that the past results were all grounded. In conducting experiments in telepathy, one person strives to obtain a thought held by another, or by others. In successful tests of this sort, much stress has been laid upon the activities of the participants. Thus, we hear them termed as senders and receivers, along with discussions of thought projection. Those are not matters of prime importance. The first thing to be considered is the effect undergone by the individual who manages to correctly name a thought held by others. He is the one who has actually demonstrated telepathy. I hope you're taking notes at home. Matter of impressions. Basically, telepathy is a matter of impressions. These are exclusive and are lost if one tries to force them. When telepathic impressions are experienced, they are at first vague, lacking shape and perspective. Their development, if noted, is gradual. But it is not always noted. Therefore, persons are sometimes surprised by what may be termed a telepathic flash which gives them the erroneous idea that completed thoughts are rapidly obtained. I'll just write that down. Therefore, in the beginning, experiments in telepathy, it is important to seek impressions only. This can be accommodated by confining the first tests to those of a simple sort. These will demonstrate whether or not the individual possesses telepathic ability, and they accomplish that aim better than more advanced experiments. For instance, certain experimenters have concluded that telepathy is comparatively rare, possessed by only about one person in five. Others have considered it so very rare that they regard persons with telepathic ability as mental prodigies. These errors can be blamed directly upon the tests which the experiment has used. Few persons can display rapid results with visualizing symbols, and it requires a great deal of what we may term telepathic discrimination for anyone to pick up one of many similar objects, such as one playing card from a pack of 52. Today's test. This should be interesting. That is why, for the first test, I have chosen one that depends upon the most definite contrast recognized by human beings, that of light and dark. This test should take place in the evening, in a room illuminated by several electric lights. The best condition is when the lights are separated, as with floor lamps or sockets. All these lights should be turned on, with the company seated about the room. After everyone has become accustomed to the existing illumination, one person goes from the room. He is the one chosen to attempt a telepathic demonstration. 
During his absence, the others turn off one of the lights and announce the fact to the absent member. Meanwhile, that person is attempting to visualize the room itself. Once he knows that a light is out, he should picture every portion of it, seeking for clear impressions. He will invariably find that one portion of the room, as visualized, will be less distinct than the others, or may actually seem darker. From that impression, he is to name the extinguished light. Once he announces that he is ready, the others turn on the light. The telepathist enters, and from the center of the room points to the light which he thinks thinks is the correct one, should be repeated. This test should be repeated, and tally of the results is a simple matter. If there are four lights in the room, for example, the person should name the right light once in four attempts, or ten times in forty, according to the law of chance. A better result than ten in forty may be regarded as an indication of telepathy, provided, of course, that the persons in the room give their full concentration upon the extinguished light, thus holding the actual thought that the absent person is seeking to obtain. Then I'll break in here briefly to say the lines, the, the words at the end of each line are blurred, so I think I'm <laughs> more or less guessing the correct word. It is advisable also to name the lights and write them on slips of paper. Mix the papers and choose one at random in order to determine which light is to be extinguished. This will relieve the person from the disturbing burden of trying to guess which light the others decided to choose. That's actually good advice. That's all for Trove this week, a short Trove, kicking off this series about mind-reading mental telepathy, and I think we will probably revisit this in the weeks to come and work our way through some at least of these wonderfully interesting articles all the way back there in 1938. But you don't have to time travel to 1938, but you can, sort of, when you go to Trove at trove.nla.gov.au Type in your search, because you never know, you never know what year you might end up in. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast this week. I've come down right to the uh, shore, the shore of the river, the banks of the river, the side of the river. Lava is strewn everywhere. This part of the world is famous for its lava fields. I'm just going to reach down here, clamber down on these rocks. Oh man, that is cold water. Coming up on next week's episode of the Skeptic Zone, part two of our conversation Oh, my conversation, or Fraser's conversation, or Brian's conversation, the three of us sitting around a table and talking about skeptical issues. What else is coming up on the Skeptic Zone? You might have to tune in and find out. Oh, and that, what you can hear now is some friendly dogs just run down to the, the side and having a bit, of a, a bit of a splash in the water. Don't forget, this is your last opportunity to buy tickets for the, or almost your last opportunity, I should say, for Skepticon 2023, the Australian Skeptics National Convention in Melbourne, Victoria, uh, the first weekend of December. Get your tickets at skepticon.org.au. A great lineup of local and international skeptical speakers, meets and greets and pub nights and who knows what else. Skepticon 2023. And thank you to my Patreon and PayPal supporters. Without you, there would be no Skeptic Zone podcast every week. But for this week, from the the side, the shore, the banks, the 
the bit near the water of the Deschutes River in Oregon. This is Richard Saunders signing off. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X, TikTok and YouTube by clicking the links at our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of the Skeptic Zone podcast or any other sceptical organisation. Tara is a genius. That's, it's not a genius. A genius? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a genius. <laughs> But Tara apparently is. Yes. Oh my. <laughs> Tara's a genius. Like, oh my God. Like, she did so well on the math test yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Back to my normal voice. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maynard says hello. Hello. Maynard just says hello. Hello, Maynard. Whether if he's feeling high. Ha, 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 ha.